Okay, so now I'm going to talk about semantic segmentation. First of all, to acknowledge that uh, these slides uh, were also done with uh, Maya Salvador and Veronica Villaplana. And here you can see the, the videos from other years. Okay, so what's segmentation? Segmentation gives uh, giving accurate boundaries of the objects in an image, okay? So there are se several types of segmentation. The one that we are gonna talk right now is semantic segmentation. This means that for each pixel of the image uh, do a prediction of its class category. So see for instance that here there's an image with several cows, so we would need like a semantic segmentation that uh, says for each pixel whether a pixel belongs to a cow or a background, for instance. And see that here if there are several cows, uh, you don't have to distinguish between different instances, so you just have to give like the mass of pixels that belongs to that category. And the same when there are other kinds of objects in the scene, okay? So this is semantic segmentation. There's another kind of segmentation that I will talk later about it, that is instant segmentation, that in this case, uh, you have to distinguish between different instances of the same category. So if there's three people here, you have to distinguish whether each pixel belongs to one uh, person, for instance, or to, uh, to another. So this is the main difference. But right now, I'm gonna talk about semantic segmentation. So first, I'm going to comment briefly the data sets that there's for this kind of challenge. And then I'm gonna talk about different methods uh, for semantic segmentation. So the most popular data sets are, first of all, Pascal, the same that I said about object detection. It also contains uh, semantic segmentation uh, annotations and instant segmentation annotations, and it contains 20 categories, the same. And then there's another one that it's Pascal context that uh, contains more categories, 540 categories. So then there are even bigger uh, data sets as these ones, uh, AD20K and COCO, that COCO was also for detection, as I showed you before. And there are other types of databases, for instance, of urban scenes. This is very important for uh, autonomous driving. And there's cityscapes and the mapillary data set that contain basically classes that are, uh, for instance, from images that are taken from inside the vehicle. So semantic segmentation. We know uh, if we think about, for instance, uh, classification, normally you have an image and you want to classify it and you give a single output. So this is a cat, a dog, or whatever. So the main difference with a segmentation is that your output is dense, so that you have uh, multiple, output, multiple outputs. So actually, if your uh, input image is this resolution, what you want is a, an output that has the same resolution with a prediction for each pixel, okay? So you can think about it like a classification per each of the pixels. So doing this, if we did like a classification problem per each pixel, what we could do is to go to each of the pixels, do a patch around them, and fit this into a convolutional neural network, for instance, and determine which is the category. So if we uh, center in one of the pixels, extract the patch, do this, and we say, okay, this pixel belongs to a cow. So if we do this for all uh, the pixels of the image, finally you would obtain the semantic segmentation. But the good thing about convolutional neural networks is that they preserve uh, this spatial information. So if normally a classification problem, you know that there's this convolutional stage and at the end the fully connected layers that do the classification. If you remove those fully connected layers and you just work with the convolutional stage that contains uh, convolutions, pulling layers, and nonlinearities, and you just work with that, uh, your output is dense. So it preserves the spatial, the spatial uh, information. So what you can do is that simply uh, the input is the whole image and the output is already the prediction for all the pixels in the input. So uh, this is what's done uh, for segmentation. The first problem here is that you know that convolutional neural networks uh, consist of convolutional layers but also pooling layers. And pooling layers, what they do is to reduce uh, the, spatial, the spatial resolution of your input. And that's not what you want because you want an output that has the same resolution as your input. So that's the, pro the first problem that an architecture for segmentation has uh, to deal with. So what can we do? Uh, first, imagine that this is uh, one of the approaches that started with this fully convolutional network. So this means that removing the fully connected layers and having everything convolutional. And what they have is a convolutional uh, neural network. And you see that uh, these kind of networks, of course, start reducing the, the resolution. And we want to recover again this resolution. So what you can do is to do an upsample and to have your loss after this upsample. So uh, you're uh, learning at a full resolution. So that's uh, uh, the first option you can do. 
So how does this work? How can you do this example when doing uh, convolutions? So first, uh, let's revisit uh, what's a convolution doing. So imagine this is your input, that it's four by four, and if you apply a kernel of three by three with stride one, this means that it's moving to every uh, position, and padding one so that your output has the same resolution as your input, so you would start here, okay? Here you convolve and you obtain this output, the one in red. You move to the next position and so on. So finally your output has the same resolution as your input. But now we are, um, yeah, and normally if uh, you don't have a stride, for instance, you can obtain a, a convolutional feature map that has a, a, a lower resolution. So imagine that instead of uh, doing this dot product in uh, every position, you uh, skip uh, one position in the middle. So you have stride two. So here you obtain an output, then in the next you obtain another output, and here is how you can obtain a lower resolution feature map. So now let's think how can we do this step. So if we have a certain convolutional feature map and we want to upsample it, so to obtain a one that has a higher resolution. So that's exactly what we need for this kind of problems. So see that what we need is um, that, for instance, if we have this input that it's two positions by two positions, okay, the first position has to give you the results for all these positions that are inside this red box. So how can we do this? You see that this, as uh, we have one of padding, these are nine positions that will be determined by that uh, one position. So what you can do is to multiply this input by nine values, and then you can obtain this, this output. So this is how uh, transpose convolutions work. So this is the opposite as a, of a convolution. So what you obtain is uh, like a higher uh, resolution. So this would be the procedure. So now this blue input would obtain this blue output. And like this, you can increase like uh, your, your resolution. But what happens here? See that uh, if you're uh, doing this stride uh, too and, and obtaining your results, you'd see that uh, this pixels from here, this output from here is obtaining two results at the same time. So uh, this would be summed. This generates a problem that it's called the checkboard effect that it means that some outputs uh, have more, um, like, see more inputs than the other ones. So this can generate like uh, an, an effect that is not desirable because uh, when you are upsampling, finally, to obtain a dense prediction, and your dense prediction will have uh, this kind of, of, of effect, as, as you will see right now. That I will show you some some examples. So what you have to guarantee is that uh, your outputs see the same number of inputs, so they all have like the same range. Okay. So the trick here is when doing transposed convolution is that uh, your kernel size has to be divisible by your stride to avoid this uh, checkboard effect. So here are some results uh, of uh, when you perform these transposed convolutions with the checkboard effect. You see that if you generate images like that, that there's like uh, this effect of a checkboard that it's not nice and we would like to avoid. So another alternative of doing these transpose convolutions instead of the operation that I just described is um, it's like another implementation. What you can do is um, if you want to increase the resolution, what you can do is simply you have your uh, feature maps. You do an upsampling by, for instance, you can do uh, bilinear interpolation or you can do what's uh, in this uh, work they did. It's unpooling. This means like the reverse of pooling. If you uh, like store the indexes of pooling, uh, you can restore it. And once you have a, a bigger resolution, then you apply some convolutions. And this will have the same effect. So this is a way to, uh, again, uh, increase your resolution. So here, this is a typical architecture that you have an, what's called like an encoder network, like a typical convolutional neural network that what it does is to uh, keep like reducing the spatial resolution and every time uh, gaining more abstract information, more information related more to semantics. And once your information is compressed, you want again to recover uh, the spatial resolution. So you have this kind of decoder and you can do it, uh, like I was saying, they do it with unpoolings and then convolutions and this has like the same effect. So there's another problem. Uh, although here, for instance, in this work, you are uh, uh, again doing a, like, uh, 
recovering a, a, a spatial resolution, the information in the encoder, uh, th like with the, because in the encoder there are lots of poolings, okay? So the poolings, what they do is to lose information because you are doing, there are some max operations that you are losing some local features that maybe are, po are important for this kind of task because at the end you want to have very accurate boundaries uh, that are surrounding the objects, for instance. So there's some information that is lost in the encoder. Uh, even if you do, uh, like these upsamplings, uh, you won't be able to recover that information. So this is the second problem that has to be dealt uh, when dealing with uh, semantic segmentation or, or any kind of segmentation that you can obtain like a coarse output. So uh, this is when uh, skip connections started to appear. This means that uh, all that information in the encoder that is lost to, rego to recover it again. So to somehow connect your encoder, like here you can see it more clearly, for instance, the, inf the information of the encoder to connect it again to the decoder. And this would be skip connections. So one of the works that did this is exactly this. So imagine you have your input image, you have your different convolutional feature maps at different convolutional stages, and you see that in the middle there are poolings, okay? And what you can do, for instance, is at several uh, stages, at several convolutional stages, to uh, do a prediction. So you see that if you do a prediction in this stage, features in this stage will be more local. Okay, so your prediction probably will have information that is more local compared to the prediction you will do at the end of the network that has uh, information more related to semantics. So at the end, you would aggregate these uh, different predictions, for instance, and obtain uh, your segmentation. So this is also called like skip connection because you are like uh, getting information from intermediate steps of your network to um, to help like uh, to recover this uh, special information at the end. So there's an alternative to, to skip connections or that well, actually both can be used at the same time. But the thing is uh, how to avoid poolings because as I told you, poolings make you lose information. You are doing there are some operation that you are losing values, okay? So, but actually poolings are necessary. First of all, because um, when you are doing uh, poolings, what you achieve also is that at the last layers of your convolutional neural network, your filters uh, will be able to see a, a bigger patch of your input image. So uh, this is very important. So filters at the first stages will uh, learn, for instance, edges, colors, textures, or th things that are very local. But filters in the last stages, thanks to the poolings uh, that you are reducing your resolution, will be able to see like a, a wider patch of, of your input image and will learn features more related to semantics, for instance, to detect uh, faces, eyes, or, or things like that. So we want to achieve that effect, but without the pooling, because pooling makes you lose information. So an alternative is to use dilated convolutions. So see that, imagine that this is like your input, okay? And this is a typical kernel, that three by three. See that this is a very small part of your input image, so this will be able to detect very small things. If you change your filter, so it has the same number of parameters, so in this case, this would be just nine parameters, but skip some positions in the middle, you see that this filter will be able to see a bigger patch of your input image. So this will be able to detect things more related to semantics. And that's what you need when you have a convolutional neural network, okay? And the same, you can do it even bigger. Uh, so like this, you can achieve this effect of uh, like uh, increasing your field of view of your network, but uh, without losing um, values like with pooling. So, here, for instance, uh, there's an first, um, this doesn't have any padding, and that's why if this is our input and that's our output, that's why our output is smaller. But if there was padding, like the output could be the same resolution as the input, okay? So we are not uh, losing resolution. See that uh, you have this uh, filter that has dilated, it's actually dilated convolutions, and that you're skipping some positions, but actually your output is in all your inputs. So you are not uh, losing any information as you are doing with uh, pooling. And this uh, works very well for, for segmentation. So now I'm just going to comment some of the state-of-the-art models for, for segmentation and for semantic segmentation. So this is uh, UNET, and what they do is this uh, first approach that I told you of having an encoder network that compacts all the information, and then a decoder network that typically is like symmetric to your encoder. And then you have this skip connection. So information 
from the encoder that goes to the decoder. So the information that is lost through the poolings in this stage can be recovered in the decoder. What does this mean, this skip connection? Uh, skip connection? So what is its function? So what it does is that the feature maps that are here in this uh, last uh, point of this stage, for instance, are concatenated, for instance, here. Or there are other types of skip connections. You can sum the features or you can uh, do any operation. But the thing is to forward information from here to here. And this uh, kind of architecture so works very well. Another of a state of the art model is this one, that it's a uh, pyramid scene parsing network. And what they do actually is first, uh, they have a, a CNN with dilated convolutions. So if you have a CNN with dilated convolutions, see that uh, you can preserve your spatial resolution until the end of the network. Normally you don't do that because this is too intensive. You, you have too many computations when uh, learning your algorithm. That's another function of pooling to reduce the, the number of computations. But you can achieve a higher uh, resolution than the one you had with a network that has pooling layers. Okay? And then uh, what they do is, uh, I think that it's also very popular for segmentation and for other tasks as well, that it's doing a kind of pyramid pooling. This means that you're like learning a module that will be able to understand um, like context, like um, semantic information of, of your problem and also local information. So how can we do this? What they do is they take the convolutional feature maps and they do several poolings on top of it at different resolutions. So see that this has a higher resolution than the other one, okay? And they apply some convolutional uh, networks here. And the thing is that, uh, for instance, this uh, feature maps will contain uh, more local information compared to the, uh, the ones that are in red, okay? That have more uh, global information because you are seeing all the input at once when doing convolutions there. So finally, you can aggregate all those by upsampling the ones that have lower resolution. You aggregate it and you have this kind of a stack of features that have information more related to semantics and more related to local features. And this uh, kind of model is added in a lot of pipelines and this works uh, very well. So you can combine, yeah, for instance, dilated convolutions and these kind of pipelines. And this is one of the state of the art models. And then there's also uh, these works that uh, it's called Deep Lab. So there are several papers that are called Deep Lab. Uh, this is the version two and the version three. And this, in, when talking about practical issues, these are some of the codes that are used uh, mostly for the community. And the, the version two, what they did is exactly what I was saying, like a network with dilated convolution. So you preserve uh, your spatial resolution until the end. And finally, they add a very typical post-processing in segmentation that is called conditional random fields. So sometimes uh, what you have to understand is that uh, semantic segmentation or, or segmentation in general, you are doing a pixel-wise prediction. Okay, so the, the different predictions for the different pixels sometimes can be like too independent. So if you want actually to obtain a, a coherent output, um, what you can do is this kind of post-processing that what it does is it relates each pixel to all the other pixels in the image, okay, with uh, graph models. And like this, they can gain some spatial coherence. So this is a typical post-processing step. And then in the next version they did, spatial I deep lab version three, uh, what they did is to remove this post-processing step and add exactly this kind of module, okay? So this kind of module that achieves exactly this, to, to gain some spatial coherence in your output because uh, you're learning from features that are very global to features that are very local. And yeah, so that's all uh, about semantic segmentation that you need to understand that as your output is a dense prediction, you need to recover, uh, to recover all, all that information that is lost in your encoder network, for instance. So that can be done with using dilated convolutions so you don't lose information or skip connections to connect what it's been lost in the encoder and recover it in the decoder. And yeah, that's all. If you have any question.